Hi, I'm Jacqueline Rinksmeyer, Executive Director of the Greater Medina Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for joining us today to watch our annual Candidates Forum. We do this event in partnership with Medina TV, and I'm here today with General Manager Jared Fry. Thank you, Jacqueline. You will notice today, as Jacqueline and I do not have our mask on, and as I interview these candidates, I will not be wearing a mask, nor will the candidates. Uh, we are following all the Department of Health guidelines in regards to spatial distancing, and with being on air and doing a broadcast, masks are not required. All candidates in local contested races were invited to participate in these interviews. This forum is designed to inform the voting public of their choices in the upcoming election. The views and opinions stated by the candidates during the course of these interviews are not necessarily those of Medina TV and the Greater Medina Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for joining us today, and thank you for exercising your right to vote in the upcoming election. Enjoy the candidates forum. Joining us now in our candidates forum is the incumbent for the Medina County Juvenile Probate Judge, and that is Judge Kevin Dunn. Kevin, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Jared. Appreciate the opportunity to talk. Yeah, glad glad you're here. Why don't you first uh, just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, my name is Kevin Dunn. I'm the judge of the Medina County Court of Common Pleas, the Probate and Juvenile Divisions. Um, I've been that in that position since August of 2013. I'm running for re-election. My background is I grew up as a kid in Medina. My father was the first Parks and Recreation Director here in Medina City. My mom was a school teacher and I have a sister, Lisa. Uh, I went to college at Miami of Ohio, got my degree there, and then my law degree from the University of Akron and started practicing law right after graduation. And have moved on now and then to become judge. Yeah, 22 years of private practice helped a lot in uh, preparing me for the role that I've subsequently taken on. Mm -hmm. Now explain a little bit, what is the role of the, the juvenile probate judge? Uh, the, the, I have the best job in the world. It's, it's really diverse. Uh, the probate court deals with all matters involving people's estates when they pass away. We deal with marriage licenses. We deal with guardianships, individuals who need the care of another person and supervision of the court to take care of them. We do minor settlements. When minors get injured in a car accident or something like that, we have to supervise that those funds are applied for the benefit of a minor. Uh, we also do adoptions, and our adoptions have skyrocketed. We have another adoption agency in the, the county and we're seeing a lot more of that activity. On the juvenile side, we do all the delinquency matters, unruly matters involving children, traffic tickets involving kids. We also do um, uh, job and family services cases, dependency, neglect, abuse cases. We see those as well. Pretty much everything that's not codified or put in another area of the law comes to the probate court. We have some very diverse and weird things that come through our court. We've done a lot of name changes recently with people with the new license Mm -hmm. and we have had a lot of situations where people's birth certificates have been wrong so we do the birth corrections as well oh wow I didn't realize there was so much uh, it's a really over there. Re I, I never did a name change in 22 years and I've supervised hundreds and hundreds of them since I've taken the bench <laughs> Well, with, with all these different things that are going on what do you see are the the biggest problems that face uh, the juvenile court in the probate right now? Uh, in, the, in the juvenile side of things, we're getting kids back to school uh, provides us a great vehicle to be able to determine are kids safe, are they healthy. Uh, we can track down the issues and provide services through the court if kids get court involved to alleviate things such as drug abuse. Uh, we also have concerns about uh, kids being exploited and we deal with a lot of those particular issues. On the probate side of things, we do uh, a volunteer guardianship program, for example, that uh, we provide individuals who don't have family members, an individual act as their guardian to make sure they're being taken care of. Recently we had a uh, nursing home closed down on a weekend and did not give notice out to people, just said move these people someplace. Mm -hmm. And we had 17 wards, individuals under guardianship, that we had to relocate within like 48 hours. Mm -hmm. And those volunteer guardians, which are people in the community, they're, they're saints uh, that do this, were integral in getting that done with our court, moving these people to different care facilities so that they could have uh, kind of uh, their services provided in a wraparound fashion. So I, I guess as you explain some of those things. What, I guess from your, your current term, what have been your top priorities uh, that you've taken on uh, since you've been in office? We've really attacked and trying to do evidence-based uh, programming 
so we can gauge our outcomes based on what we're putting in. We do a lot in the diversion area with, with children, uh, families, we try to get contact in. We've started a program called TI-180, it's Teen Intervention 180, where we do kind of a snap shot if we have a child brought to us. A uh, typical example may be that uh, underage drinking party that happens at graduation. Uh, we'll bring those people in, their parents, everything, uh, screen the children, make sure that they're okay, and then we can run them through a diversion program. If we find out kids have more significant issues, we put them into our drug court program. We have an intensive component and a non-intensive component. The intensive component, uh, I'm proud to say we've graduated 185 uh, kids from that program. It's a long uh, commitment. Uh, the parents had to be committed to it. We change uh, interactions in the family through that process, uh, sober up children. And it takes about a year to get a, a child successfully through that program because you're changing brain chemistry, uh, you're changing chemistry in the household, and we're trying to build a toolbox for the family so that we have these kids come back in our community as kids we want to have back to begin with. We don't give up on kids, but we want them to be good neighbors. We want that, the kid to be the kid that's going to cut his grass when he turns 18, 19, take his garbage to the curb, and understand responsibilities. Wow. Now, as, as you look to head into another term, uh, heading for re-election, what would be your goals heading into this next term? Uh, our next term goals are uh, continuing building on some of the projects we're working on now. We have a teen uh, driving program called Take Control. We just received a grant, uh, additional $20,000 grant from the state of Ohio to perfect that program. That's run with, uh, we had three foundations that uh, individuals who lost children in, in driving accidents, uh, combined with the forces of the Montville Police Department, ourselves, Westfield Insurance Companies, and we offer a driving program at no cost to uh, teen drivers. And they complete the program. It's obstacle kind of based processing uh, of situations, and it's done on a Saturday, once to twice per month, supervised by a Sports Car Club of America drivers and or certified OPADA. Uh, driving teachers, uh, state troopers, sheriff's deputies, and they're in the cars with the kids. Our court uh, finances that op part of the operation to ensure that our kids are trying to be driving, learning safe skills. It's no cost to parents, no cost to the kids involved, and it helps to get them an insurance reduction. Mm -hmm. So it's a win-win all the way around, and I can't say enough for the vocational school for going to bat, and a couple of our uh, Larry Obhoff, uh, Steve Hambly, and some others to help us get the funding to build that pad so we can hopefully not lose any more children in our community for from driving accidents. Mm -hmm. We're also going forward putting in a new case management system at the court. Um, ourselves, the two common pleas judges, Judge Kimbler, Judge Collier, and Dave Wadsworth are, are uh, beginning this cycle. It's a tough thing to put together. It's a new computerization system. We have to train all of our people. We're helping to develop what we need in the software, so that'll be uh, a long haul to get that resolved and up and running. But we're looking forward to having a more efficient court by having those processes put together. And uh, we'll wait and see what else comes on our agenda. Well, I guess one of the things on the agenda, you talked about all the different courts and, and you guys working together with the software side of things, but there's also a discussion of a, a courthouse project. And I know that's Correct. been a, a hot issue. And in fact, it's uh, on the city side, at least going to the ballot uh, in November. What are your thoughts so far with that courthouse project? Uh, the courthouse project, I was a presiding judge. We uh, go through a process of selecting one of us to be the presiding judge. I've been that, in that position a couple of times. Uh, I've scouted out courts. Our court, uh, people don't come into the building enough. They don't see behind the scenes. But our common pleas courts are in need of upgrade and replacement. Uh, in short, that's where we stand with those items. I traveled and looked at probably 15, 16 different court facilities. I've worked with the court, uh, National Courts uh, Facilities Commission. I've talked to people at the federal court level, uh, the state Supreme Court as well too. And putting, combining all these things to build a building is very difficult and it's not inexpensive. Uh, the city is taking a route, the goal was I believe to have the city municipal court and the county courts all under one building, so there'd be a, a shared cost in uh, supervision fees, uh, maintenance, all of those types of things, figuring, hey, if we build a, a bigger facility that we can put everyone in there, good to go. That has hit a snag, I believe, with the city. The city desires to put that on the ballot to determine whether they want the municipal court to go in there and allow the people of the city of Medina to uh, go forward and vote on that and approve that. 
the rest of the county is going to go forward and, and build the county courthouse. Mm -hmm. There's a difference. The municipal court deals with the city of Brunswick issues, Seville, uh, Brunswick, and they have a limited jurisdiction. The county courts deal with the entire county. So the, the court building, it's my understanding, is going to go forward and be built. And the people out in Litchfield won't be voting on what the city of Medina wants to do with the uh, Medina Municipal Court. Mm -hmm. And that's to go on the ballot and the folks in the city of Medina can determine what they like to do with that. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of, of some of the issues uh, that are right now happening in, in the world, uh, look at COVID-19 here, two, two sides of it. One, uh, safety protocols that you have and have instituted in the court or, or you would like to see done. Sure. And then I guess the second side of that, any fallback from people that have been unemployoyed, losing their jobs, possibly sure. leading to a higher crime rate. What are your, your thoughts on both issues well, there? When, when we had these announcements, um, I was actually at a seminar with my probation department uh, members in Columbus when the governor came in and issued an order that all public items had to be shut down. Mm -hmm. We were halfway through that seminar on a day and at noon we were told to go home. Uh, came back and we had to make efforts. Our court is very open, the probate court is, for example, where you can walk right up to everyone's desk when you file things. So we had to adopt processes and procedures. We had to have the maintenance staff come in and cut in a window in a wall so we'd have a pass-through area. We've expended a great deal of monies on items that won't be recoverable, uh, glass plates, uh, you know, plastic, plexiglass to keep barriers and things through. It was a struggle to get the items like sanitizer at the inception of this. I went in on the weekend and I cleaned the entire court. Uh, I have approximately 60 employees between the detention center, the juvenile court, and the uh, probate court. So I cleaned everyone's area up because I had at my house, I was a hoarder of those type of products and had those and I, I cleaned everyone's things so we came in on Monday. But it's been a real workout. Uh, we've had some issues. It's been difficult to monitor children. Uh, we've turned a lot of that over because our probation officers no longer go in a house. We don't have kids coming to school. So we have d limited availability to track kids down. Parents have been very good for the most part. If we need a kid drug tested, they will conduct the test, leave it on the step, come right back out. And they're, they're buying in that we want to get this resolved for our child too. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing some positive things of it, but I would note that I do a lot of what we call copper hearings, which are programming hearings to re, uh, review people's outstanding court costs and bills. And financially, this COVID has really taken a bite out of people's ability to be employed. Uh, even if people are still employed, they may have their hours dramatically cut. Mm -hmm. So those costs have to be dealt with and shared with some way, and we're making reductions and making modifications in, in payment. We want to hold kids responsible for their actions and teach parents to be responsible for their kids, but also blend it into that. We have to also understand that there are people in our community that need help, mm -hmm. and we're trying to make that uh, a possibility whenever whenever we can. And then on terms of the, the juvenile side, I don't know if it may apply to probate, you can let me mm -hmm. know or not, but in terms of the, yeah, the current social unrest, whether it's social injustice or racial injustice, is there a way that the juvenile court's looking at things or preparing for things or trying to be help, you know, preventative or, or helpful moving forward? Our, our, our goal is to treat good people well. Mm -hmm. If you do something that goes beyond the law, we don't judge you on the, your, your skin color, what color your hair is. That's not part of the process. Mm -hmm. Our goal is the juvenile court is a, a feeder facility. It's a touchstone. Same with the probate court, where we can provide services to try to alleviate these issues so they don't become problems when people become adults. Mm -hmm. uh, our detention center uh, is operating. Uh, we have about 12 kids. Uh, they're currently today. And the, the issues we face out there are, are COVID related too. Hey, we can't bring every kid into the detention center. The uh, arresting agencies are told, hey, unless this is an issue involving violence, uh, concern about the child's safety and stuff, issue a summons, we'll bring the children in a different way. The unrest in those items, those are societal issues that I can't rule on uh, one way or another, mm -hmm. but we can take some steps to ensure that our kids uh, develop integrity concern for others, and those are part of the processes we try to instill uh, at our detention center. We have uh, the, the, the garb that the, the children have to wear. On the back of it, it doesn't say inmate or something like it, it says be a good human. Hmm.
be good. We do some other types of programming. We have, I have on my wrist a, a program called Because I Said I Would. Fascinating individuals reached out to our facilities to do a, uh, a program to keep your promises. Maintain your promises. A promise means something. So we try to integrate that into what we do. So if I tell you, hey, if you don't do this, this is what your consequence is going to be. Kid comes in front of me, they get that consequence. Mm -hmm. And I can tell them that, why, did, why are you getting that? Because you told me that would be the consequence for what I did. And it's kind of neat to see kids that have maybe never been invested, uh, didn't think their word was worth much, start to see that light bulb goes on. Yeah. And that's really pretty cool. Yeah. It's one of the cool parts of my job, <laughs> one of the numerous cool parts. Well, let's speak about the, the cool parts of the job. What, what would be your skill set or what would set you apart uh, from your opponents? Well, I've done the job. That's a huge issue to look at. Uh, my job is not all nice, fun things to do. In a day-to-day -day basis, I spend a good part of my day doing administrative tasks, reviewing pleadings, filings, going through. I have magistrates that may be conducting a hearing. I'll review those matters. I do all of the heavy lifting types of cases, cases I know are going to go to the Court of Appeals. Uh, if it's a significant matter uh, of an estate, uh, I'll be handling those matters. Uh, I have. The training wheels have been off me for a very long time. For 22 years, I handled the, the highest level of cases. I did death penalty cases as a private practitioner. I practiced in the probate arena. I had a lot of estates, trusts. I have lots of clients out there. That created a little bit of a problem when I first got on the bench because I had 160 cases that I had somehow been involved with that I had to recuse myself from. Uh, but my involvement in that stuff is, is really unique. I also get to work with the Judges Association, and we work kind of hand in hand where legislation's trying to be passed or they, they'll write a bit of legislation. And before COVID, we would all go down to Columbus, a group of us, and they'd run this stuff by us and we'd be able to comment on those. That's a huge, huge benefit for the local community because what someone may have a knee jerk reaction on something really has consequences across 88 different counties and 88 different counties deal uh, with things differently. Mm -hmm. So I've had that incredible insight to look at those things. Background wise, I was raised by uh, two parents that cared about me a lot. I still go out and have uh, breakfast with my mom every Wednesday except for tomorrow or uh, not today. Today is Wednesday. I couldn't do it today. She had something else. But um, my, my family dedicated a lot. They, they taught me what it is to have a servant's heart and I think that's what you need for the job. Yeah. Now, uh, before I turn it over for you to give one last uh, speech to the, the residents here directly to our camera, sure. Uh, is there anything I missed that you would like to bring up? Uh, I could be here for days <laughs> telling you all the good stuff that we do at the court. I am fortunate to have, as I indicated, 60 plus good employees. Mm -hmm. And they make your job very uh, worthwhile when you can dedicate something to them, know that they're going to do their best. And we don't hide from uh, something that gets screwed up. They bring it right to us and we deal with problems. That's our job. We're problem solvers. Mm -hmm. And I think we have a very good crew and I'm looking forward to continuing this for another six years until uh, they, t they rest this away from me or I'm not here. <laughs> oh, great. Well, you were speaking with Kevin Dunn, the incumbent uh, Medina County Juvenile Probate Judge. Well, this is your moment. You can look directly at our camera right here and uh, say what you want to say to the voters. Well, I appreciate you coming out in November. It's going to be a very uh, unusual year, and I hope that I get your vote. I would tell you that uh, I'm experienced. My experience is real life experience. It's judicial bench experience during the toughest of the cases. I, uh, my experience uh, flows uh, out there and, and I can stack up against anybody. Caring, we do programs. We want children to do well in our community. We have programs set up for individuals under guardianship and we want to make sure that they're taken care of. The, the most uh, humbled people in our community need to be raised up sometimes and dealt with by the probate court. And we're effective. We, our, our stuff is documented uh, in your community we're making a big positive impact and as indicated we want to hold uh, children accountable and parents accountable for their children and also bring them back in and trust them and tell them that this community cares about them and they're part of our community so we will deal with that just as you would dealing with your own children. Great and once again that's uh, Kevin Dunn the incumbent for Medina County Juvenile Probate uh, Judge. Uh, usually I like to shake the candidate's uh, hand, well, but I know we're in different times hey, here. I, I'll, I'll just wish you the best of luck. Uh, thank you this so November. much. Okay. And I, I'll put my mask on after I leave here. I appreciate you distancing and doing this. this yes. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Yes, thank Thanks, you. Jared. All right.